the silicon qubit. Uh, here we first need to think about what, what is required to make a computer, quantum computer, right? First, it needs to be a scalable physical system. You cannot just say I make a very nice qubit or two qubit. It's going to be useless. We know that we need at least maybe 1,000 logical qubit, not just physical. A qubit that is uh, tolerant to uh, error, we call it logical qubit. And in order to do something useful, like the Schwarz algorithm, or even maybe more. So you need to be scalable, right? Another thing is that you need to be able to initialize it. But to initialize it, uh, it's not just initialization. You need to have a high fidelity, right? You cannot say, I think I initialize all of them to zero, but then actually only 99% are zero. Then your quantum computer will have a problem, right? It needs to have a long decoherence time. This one is understandable, right? So you can have enough gate oper operation before it die out. And of course, you need to have a universal set of quantum gates, right? It's just like in the classical logic, uh, you hope that you, the land gate can create any type of gates that you want, right? You cannot have a quantum system that is so good, everything is so good, but just that you cannot create a two, two, big, two cubic gate, right? Another, and, and this is, of course, uh, due to uh, DiVincenzo, Senso, I don't know how to pull uh, And uh, he wrote this paper, a uh, very uh, a seminal paper. And then uh, you should be able to do measurement. Now, measurement, you also need to make sure that you can do some specific measurement, right? You cannot say, every time I do measurement, I need to measure all the uh, qubits. I, I want to be able to selectively measure some of the qubit. Right? Because some algorithm will not work if you measure them on the same time, like the quantum teleportation. Right? So these are the five criteria that we need to make sure when we build a quantum computer. Now, there are also two more criteria for quantum communication. Right? Quantum communication is like all those uh, encryption. Right? Um, you definitely, because it's quantum communication, some qubit are stationary, some are flying. Right? You need to make sure that you are able to have this type of system. Another is that uh, you need to be faithfully transmit the information from one place to another place. Okay? So now we will look at only these five criteria. Uh, we will be pretty easy to see that for a silicon qubit. Uh, the last one is easy. I think I can measure them one by one. We will see that. We'll show that it has a universal set of quantum gate, which is pretty uh, straightforward. You just need one gate that can do entanglement, like the C log gate, and then you can do all the other single qubit gate, arbitrary single qubit gates. Then, in principle, you can do a uh, you have a universal set of gates. But just note that, right? In principle, uh, there's no nothing called universal. Because in uh, operation in a Hilbert space, you have infinite number of possible state, uh, possible uh, operation. So in principle, you cannot have a finite set to form this infinite number of sets. But however, this is good enough for uh, the uh, operation that we need for the uh, algorithm. I don't know if I've said this enough, but just... No, uh, uh, to see if you can understand, right? Maybe it's my limitation, right? We look at the co the coherence style. We don't care too much now, and then we look at the initialization. So basically, in the following lecture, I'm going to talk about silicon qubit. One is that we will show that we can do one qubit and two qubit manipulation. We can do initialization, and we can do readout, readout, initialization, and then. Uh, qubit operation, right? And we assume coherence time is good enough and also, uh, how to say, it's scalable, right? This is what we are all fighting now, nowadays, right? So why we use silicon spin qubit? What does it mean? It actually is the electron spin, right? It, it actually, not, not really, but what I'm talking about is the electron spin. There are many different types of spin qubit in the silicon including, for example, you can use phosphorus atom and better in the silicon, and you use something that uh, the isotope that has a nuclear spin, 
and then you will get a spin qubit. But what we're talking here is more about the silicon spin qubit, right? Uh, this is, as I said, because we need error correction, and error correction is very difficult. You actually need about 1,000 physical qubit to form a robust uh, logical qubit, which is very robust that immune to any error, right? very high fidelity. Then how can you make 1,000 qubit? Like what we're doing just now, only the magnetic field or uh, magnetic resonance, this is a little bit difficult to scale up. And same for superconducting qubit, also uh, not that easy, but I think every, we can find solution eventually, right? Just for the sake of discussion. So, so as a result for some co complex quantum algorithm, right? You may need thousands of logical qubit, and then it means you need millions of uh, physical qubit. When you talk about millions, billions, you think about silica. This is the only thing, uh, I think, probably human can achieve nowadays. Easily put identical thing in a, a short time uh, in, in the order of millions and billions, right? Another thing actually should not be overlooked is that quantum processor. Now, uh, you, some of you already taken this fundamental quantum uh, algorithm. You know that it, is, it depends strongly on the classical control. Or just now, actually, not just algorithm. Just look at the, uh, the single qubit gate operation. It also needs classical control, right? How are you going to shine? Uh, uh, here we're talking about the uh, magnetic field, right? How are you going to change the magnetic field with a pulse with so, so fast, right? Uh, this all need classical control. So they need to be integrated with classical processor. And naturally, you will think if I can put in silicon, boom, everything works well because all my classical processor are already the, uh, in silicon, right? And particularly, you think about quantum machine learning or optimization. They use a lot of classical parts, right? The quantum parts is only for the uh, most difficult, maybe, uh, optimization. But then the classical part need to do the uh, density gradient, gradient descent, not density gradient, the gradient descent, all this optimization algorithm. If you can make them close, that would be great, right? So silicon is a very a natural choice, right? So we can have spin in electron or spin in nucleus. Like I taught, mentioned earlier to use the phosphorus atom, right? That was some, one of the early choice uh, by the people, yeah. Now, but here we talk about electron spin. So in order to increase the coherence time, people will try to have a, I did not say clearly. So, I mean, I forgot what is the purity. I think it is uh, 100 ppb, I forgot, right? Maybe they purify the silicon to uh, 100 ppb per, per billion, right? So it, well, among 1 billion atoms, you only maybe have 100 of the uh, isotope, silicon 29, which has a nuclear spin because you have an extra neutron, so it is not paired up, right? And why is this is a problem? Because now your nucleus has spin, you are going to have the sp uh, spin interaction with your uh, electron spin. Once you are interaction, then you have a way to lose your information to the external environment, right? So that's why we want to have a purified uh, system. And as a result, they can increase the T2 time. Uh, I, I might have a typo here, actually. Maybe I swap it. Uh, this should be star, and this, is, this has no star, right? Two are uh, 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 very long, right? But still, you need to work at very low temperature, like 50 mini Kelvin or lower, and you see that we need a very huge magnetic field, 1.4 tera, uh, I mean Tesla, right? Now, think about why. It also related to the speed. What is the normal precession frequency? Thank you. Right. And why this precession is important? Because this is like a Z gate, right? So if you want to finish the rotation fast, then you need to have a large B0. 
right? So that, so that is one of the reasons, right? But not just this. This also related to how you split the two level. What is the uh, Zeman splitting, right? Which I actually uh, did not tell you. That is the name when we discussed this. This is equal to omega L. I did not h bar omega l right maybe i can rewrite it this is equals to uh, e over m b0 right and you will find that times h bar sorry yeah which is h bar omega l am i right let me redo the math. I forgot. This is your two mu ball minute, two mu times B zero, right? And what is mu? Mu is H bar divided by two times the uh, gyro magnetic ratio, right? Which is H bar E divided by M, right? So this is H bar omega L. Right? So basically, the splitting is h bar omega l. Now, you have two states. If your b0 is small, then what happens? You cannot distinguish them. You want to get to be much larger than the temperature, the thermal energy. Okay? So this can be a drawback of, of the silicon qubit that need a large electric field. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Uh, can I say again? Very pure. Uh, most, so you make all the silicon of silicon 28. If you have impurity, like you have a lot of silicon 29, like 5% in naturally occurred silicon, mm -hmm. they have the nuclear spin. Okay. The spin is going to interact with your electron spin. Correct, because it has even number of neutron. Yeah. Uh, silicon has 14 proton, right? I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 14 proton, right? So they have 14 neutron here, but 15 neutron here. Then you have an unpaired neutron. So you have the spin, right? Neutron also have spin half, right? If I'm correct, yeah. <clears throat> Does it have, the silicon have an unpaired electron? It has, but uh, in the crystal, they are all pair, right? So, yeah, so there's no net spin, unlike the ferromagnetic material. Okay, so let's look at initialization. From now, you will see all this, uh, actually, uh, I copy from the uh, paper. This is a nature paper. Uh, I forgot the year, maybe 10 years ago or longer. How do we initialize the qubit? Now we agree that we want to, we need, to, we are going to use the spin to do the uh, quantum computing to process the information. And then we put it under the magnetic field. And in this case, I put it under the magnetic, which is uh, magnetic field is pointing down. Magnetic field is pointing down in this paper. How do I initialize it? Well, we already say that we have Siemens splitting, right? So it means that the one that is one, right? This is one, this is zero. Uh, maybe this is not good because then you, you will get confused with, uh, because in the past we don't call this, right? We don't call it one as the higher state. Let's just call this the excited state. This is the ground state. Well, just wait. Let's wait, wait gradually, and then uh, they will all become a uh, ground state, right? It will lose energy. What is the problem of this? You have to wait. You have to wait. <laughs> and uh, it's not guaranteed, right? Uh, in principle, I wait for a long enough right. time, yeah, then they will all to ground state, right? But there's a big contradiction. What is the time you need to you need to wait the characteristic time. It's just the T1, the relaxation time. 
But T1 is important. So you basically think that I want to initialize it fast, but then I also need a long T1 because later I'm going to have, a, uh, to have operation, right? So this is contradiction, right? So this is also slow. Let's say even you can do it. Maybe you can change the environment so the T1 is different during in initialization and during operation. That is possible, but uh, this is not a good way to do that, right? So uh, it is slow. Now, another possibility is that we can, here is the quantum dot. So I did not discuss. When you have a qubit, you, you, when you have an electron, how do you store the electron? You must need to confine it to a potential well. Otherwise, you have tons of electron there, right? So I confine it to a potential well so that there's only one electron. So that's what we call the quantum dot. And then we put it next to a reservoir. Reservoir is nothing but just a contact, right? A contact has tons of electrons and it has a Fermi level. So what we can do is that you have a quantum dot like this. Then you have two possible spin. One is spin down and one is spin up. And you see that I put it in different location. The spin up, I put it as a lower energy spin up as higher energy. And why is that? Because again, because the magnetic field, magnetic field is pointing down, the energy equals to negative mu B, right? But mu is just equals to negative of the spin, right? Because the gyro magnetic ratio is uh, opposite, is negative, right? The spin and the magnetic moment have opposite direction for electron, right? So this is just equals to SB, right? So if they are in the same direction, I have, hey, did I say something wrong? If they are in the opposite direction, it should be a lower energy. So if they are in the same direction, let me just make this into dot product. Yeah, of course. If they are in the same direction, then this is positive, right? So then you have a higher energy, right? If they are in opposite direction, this is negative, right? So, so you have a lower energy. Is this okay? Yeah? So that's why in this paper particularly, spinning down actually has a higher energy. And then what can we do? We just adjust the quantum uh, well potential. Right? We'll discuss a little bit later. It's just okay, just your capacitor to bias the quantum dot, make it higher and lower, or you change the reservoir energy. So that the higher energy can tunnel, but the lower energy cannot. So what does it mean? I can have the reservoir, have the Fermi level of the reservoir at this point. Yeah? So in this reservoir, anything below the Fermi energy, a field, that's what we learned in uh, semiconductor device physics, right? Anything before the Fermi level a few, particularly now we are at what? 5 milli Kelvin, 50 milli Kelvin. Basically, this Fermi direct distribution is just a step function, right? If it's 300 Kelvin, we still don't know. So basically, here is saying that the upper, if you have a state electron in the upper state, then it will tunnel out because it has energy to tunnel out. But those at the lower states, it cannot, right? It cannot climb up because there's no empty space for it to tunnel. So by doing this, we will be able to uh, initialize it. Now, this is not a typical way, maybe not, I don't know. It's not the main idea of this paper, but I, I still want to say, just show you one possibility, right? There may be other problem. So here show that if you have the spin pointing up, which has a higher energy, you try to measure the charge inside this quantum dot is basically constant, negative. But if you have one that is pointing down, you measure the charge as a function of time, it was negative and suddenly charge becomes zero because it tunnels out, right? So this is a stochastic process. The charge tunnel out, but it has a characteristic time of the tunneling rate, one over the tunnel rate. T 
handling rate. Yeah. Will get out. Yes. And that's considered the initialization. Yeah, and then all the excited state get out. Then only those uh, at the lower state, right? At the ground state will stay, right? And then you can initialize them. I mean, you might think that then once tunnel out, then we have nothing, right? But because you don't have the lower states, then this one is going to fill it back. Only those, uh, it only can fill the lower states if you do it right. Okay. Yeah. How is it formed? It just happens when the electron away from the host and the chromatin. Is it because of the potential? No, for quantum dot, we need to apply a potential to it. So basically, you raise the barrier around that dot, then potentially it becomes a barrier. Yeah, I, I will show that circuit later. Okay. Now, then. Another way to initialize the state is through uh, another extra state. Now, so if you look at this, it actually have two states in this quantum dot. One is on the top, we call it n equal to two, and other is n equal to one. This is just like an orbit, right? Like the atom, you have n equal to one, n equal to two, a, a triangular well. Right, but your qubit is actually formed at the bottom n equal to one. That you can have spin up and spin down. So each of them can have spin up and spin down. When you do computation, you only work on this level. Okay. Now, so it, then what happened? Now, if I want to wait for the spin in this particular case, right? I then I, I I'm going to label it as one spin down. Because again, the uh, magnetic field is still pointing down, right? Magnetic field is still down, okay? So going down, if you have spin down, you actually have a higher energy. So how can I, so here is one spin down, if I call it, this is one down, and this is one up, right? One just saying that it is at the n equal to one state, right? So it's just like the atom, you have the principal quantum number and then spin number is just the same, right? Right, how do I get that? As it show here, the rate is one over T1. We know that, very long, and we want it to be long, right? Because uh, we want to have a very uh, robust and long coherence time qubit. But what we can do is this, uh, to do initialization, we are going to apply uh, external pulse, 31 gigahertz. What does it do? This pulse is only that, have only this energy, uh, new one, two. It's only enough to excite the one down state to, uh, maybe I say something wrong, oh, to, to, the, uh, to the two up state, okay? Actually, I'm right, uh, to here, okay? So it's not going to excite this one up because this is too far. So all this one up is not going to absorb the energy, right? So only this guy will go up. And this is easy because this is an active driving, right? Just pump enough energy, then you put all this uh, one down state up. Now, this system, however, can decay quickly from the two state to one state, right? Due to some physics, maybe I, I, I'm not good enough to explain why, right? Just atomic physics, you solve the matrix, uh, as long as your wave function have enough overlap or whatever spontaneous emission, but you just trust that, trust that, uh, trust me that it can go down very quickly, but it, it's not going to go back to one down state because the spin is different. You will prefer to jump to the one up state, right? When you go from one state to another state, usually uh, unless there are other interaction, the spin will conserve because if you want to change the spin, you need some Hamiltonian to flip your spin. But here I don't have any spin, right? I don't have background spin if there, there, there's no noise, right? It's just spontaneous uh, emission. So it also can go very fast from two up to one up. So from this state to this state with this gamma being very high, okay? 
So this is another way to do initialization, right? So this is very common. Um, but this is initialization. I just want to say very common to borrow another state to do something. For example, later we may talk about the neutral atom uh, qubit, right? Uh, if you went to the two day, Tuesday seminar, they talk about that, right? Uh, then when they do the single qubit, they just work under the low energy n equal to one manipulation. And then if you want to do some two qubit computation, you excite it to very high energy at the end, very large becomes the river state, right? And they can they can do Coulomb blockade and thus you can do C not gate, things like that, right? So this is a very smart idea. So you can think about this, right? Borrow another state. We mostly do the computation use these two states, the spin states, but use this to borrow, okay? So basically, this summarizes how you do initialization, right? So do we need any math? I don't, don't think so, right? You already know this uh, T1, and uh, this excitation is no difference like uh, what we are doing with the rapid oscillation. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is like two times faster than the previous initialization, right? If we excite it to the next state. Not two times, and many times faster. Uh, co compared to thermalization, yeah, it should be many times faster, yeah. You need to have this two state n equal to two available. Remember, this already you have two states in n equal to one, right? So for thermalization, you will just stay there and wait for this one to decay by one over t one. But now I try to in. Active, this is called active reset. But not, I, I don't know if we call this active reset. There's another uh, possible uh, way to do active reset is that I do a measurement. If it is up, then I apply a rapid pulse to convert it to ground. If it is zero, then I don't do anything. That's another active reset. I think this is, should also be called active reset. But my, I don't know, I, I don't know if this is the right name for active reset. But we actively apply a pulse to bring it to higher state. Then it will decay quickly. Yeah. Okay. So we are done with the initialization. You should understand this because not much math, particularly even this excitation. Um, is that like the rapid? You probably need to uh, read some book, uh, but all the math is simpler than what we have learned. If you look at Foots, right, the book uh, Atom of Atomic Physics by Foots, it was talking about the uh, uh, microwave pulse, how you excite from lower state to higher state, although it's qubit, but the, the treatment will be the same. Okay, so I think uh, we have enough background. Good, so we are done with the uh, initialization, right? So this looks promising. Now the next thing what we need to do is, then how are you going to read the qubit? Now, this is difficult. Qubit, it's very difficult to sense a qubit. Qubit sensing is difficult, right? So in this case, what do they call, do is to do something called spin to charge conversion. So you do some manipulation so that if your spin is pointing up, you get certain charge. If your spin is pointing down, you get another charge. Then from by sensing the charge, you know what is the uh, qubit. Okay, so we can take this opportunity to understand what is a quantum dot, how it can make, for example. This is not silicon, however. You will see that this is something called MOSFET, right? This is aluminum gallium nitride barrier with gallium arsenide, I mean aluminum gallium arsenide barrier with gallium arsenide. So let's look at the structure. You start with a semi-insulating uh, gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide has a wider band gap than silicon, two point something EV, right? And but then you epitaxially growth another layer of aluminum gallium arsenide on top of it. Aluminum has a small atom. A smaller atom usually gives you a larger band gap. Let's just think about carbon has a which is diamond has a band gap of five, I forgot five point something. Then you go to silicon, larger atom, smaller band gap with, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, about 1.12 EV, right? Then you go down the periodic table, germanium, which is even bulkier, 
uh, which has a band gap of 0.66. And then you go down again to tin, it becomes uh, metal. It has no band gap, right? So this is a general tra uh, trend. When you have a small atom, you get a larger band gap. And this has nothing to do with quantum computing, but this, uh, like people done this for the laser or heterostructure, they know this very well. That is called like binary or ternary structure. They mess up, mix up all the atoms. But the most important thing is that you want to make them epitaxially growth. So I don't know uh, what they, you need to keep the same lattice because think about this, right? I have some large atom at the bottom and then you try to put some small atom. If you want to keep the lattice, you need to strain the atom. And if you have a, something too thick, they are going to crack because of the mechanical stress. Then you get dislocation. And that is going to generate a lot of defects from the electrical perspective. Okay, so hemp, this is something called hemp, high electron mobility electron transistor. But we are not doing hemp. The idea is this. Because the bottom is gallium arsenide, the top, so what am I showing here? We are actually cutting here, right? This is A, this is B, so this is A, this is B. This is what we are showing here, right? So I have a low, small band gap and a wide band gap here. So naturally, just be, uh, not naturally, just uh, because the way we dope it, we dope a lot of, uh, here is silicon donor, which uh, silicon is a donor in aluminum gallium arsenide, is going to bring the Fermi level really close to the valence conduction band, <laughs> right? So naturally, under zero bias, you will going to form a triangular barrier, right? Do you see this? The electron will just tend to stay here. And this barrier is very narrow. And it's just like a quantum well. And that's why this is called the two-dimensional electron gas. Because in this vertical direction, it's highly confined. You basically just have a, a very highly confined, so this is like a, a confined electron, right? But then on the XY plane, it's just everywhere, so it's just like electron gas, but two-dimensional, it cannot go in the third dimension, right? So this one, by doing aluminum gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide heterostructure, I successfully form the confinement. The confinement in the C direction. Okay, but the quantum dot it's a 3D, it's just a dot, right? I did not, I still need to confine in another two direction, right? So then what do you do? This is the top view of the wafer. You look down, so the bird view, right? So if I say, this is the bird view going down, then that is what you have. You look down into the wafer, right? So this top layer, just plain, or you're looking at here, you only see aluminum gallium arsenide. Under the screen, then you have this gallium arsenide. So imagine you have a two-dimensional electron gas just uniformly forming under this screen. Is this okay? Is that clear? Any questions? Sometimes it's more difficult to understand this thing than math, right? Is the... Um the dark region that we're seeing, is that the aluminum gallium arsenide or is that the, just the gallium arsenide? We actually don't know, but uh, it's supposed to be aluminum gallium arsenide, but it can actually have some insu uh, insulator, like uh, dielectric, right? So, but what I'm saying that, yes, so if you don't consider other thing, this should be the aluminum gallium arsenide. And below it is the gallium arsenide, right? But maybe you see it or you maybe you don't see it, I don't know, yeah, but I try to look. Mention the direction, the yeah. step, yeah. TMP, RQ are just metal on top? Yes, now I will then talk about this. These are just the metal, right? We call it electro. So you, do you see that? You said M, P, uh, M, R, and T. This 
form the quantum dot. Why? Because if I apply the negative potential to here, isn't that all the two-dimensional gas underneath will be repelled? I put a very high negative potential. And then only this point has enough high enough potential to keep track of an electron, right? So it is like this. If I do a cut, let's say along this direction, right? I call it C and D. If you look at the potential profile, then you will see this. And this is the, let's say the potential. Right, this is the potential. Do you see that? And then I can trap one electron. Okay? Now, this is only 2D, right? But remember, vertically, I also confine it. Right? So basically, it's just a, like a box in which I can put one electron. Yeah. Yes, you can say that it just like it repel all the electron, right? But the way you repel it is just by raising the potential. Then you just like the wall in the real space, right? You raise the wall and every people standing in above the wall got repelled. Only one guy can stay. And at the same time, the top and bottom, the ceiling also try to compress so that only one people can fit into this. And this compression is because of this quantum well this hetero interface, right? So you try to squeeze it uh, in the uh, vertical direction and then squeeze it all around the barrier. So by applying the appropriate uh, voltage, they will be able to only contain one electron or a zero electron or a two electron, depends on the potential you apply. Okay, now then, you have one electron here. Is this spin up or spin down? That is what we want to determine, okay? But the way we do this is that they do it, uh, of course, right? Uh, you also at the same time can have the gate electron, just an extra couple link, right? To control how many electrons you want, okay? T, M, and R kind of form the initial barrier. Then you have this P to further fine tune the potential inside this well, right? I can make this well higher or deeper, shallower or deeper by using P, okay? Now, I have something called point contact, quantum point contact transistor. I, I don't know exactly what, how they, what they implement, but doesn't matter. It's very sensitive to the charge here. It's based on tunneling. This, uh, trans, this, this point contact transistor, the operation principle is based on tunneling. And you know tunneling is very sensitive to the barrier. So if I have a charge inside this quantum dot, it's going to affect my barrier because we couple to each other. So if I have a charge here, I will have much lower current. If I have a no charge here, I have much higher current. Do you agree with this? So now I am able to detect the charge by measuring the current through this transistor. Okay. So the next question is how do I uh, know, how do I relate the spin direction to the charge? Okay. Uh, let me see, right? And the point they use this sensitive thing is also very important that it has a very hard, fast detection rate, eight microsecond. This basically represents the very important quantity, the readout time, right? If you have a system, it takes one year to read out, useless, right? Because in quantum algorithm, we need to do a lot of readout. So it takes eight microseconds to read out. But then it also, that means that your T1 and T2 better be long, much longer than eight microseconds, right? And luckily we say that 
they usually is in this order, right? Um, okay, this quantum dot also coupled to the reservoir. It can tunnel in and tunnel out, similar to this picture, okay? And that is how we do the spin charge conversion. So let's take a look how we do it. Uh, but then why do I do this here? I actually, I, I think we, I want to do this Siemens splitting uh, next time. I, I should finish the uh, description of this charge conversion first, right? So how do we do it, right? Very messy picture, but it's very interesting. First of all, the magnetic field is pointing down. Just uh, make sure that you remember. Magnetic pointing down, so the spin which is pointing down is going to have higher energy, okay? So let's see how you do the readout. This is just the experiment. So you will see some redundant step. First of all, I have a reservoir. Now what I discussed earlier, right? And then this is the quantum dot. It has two levels, spin up or spin down. Why it has two levels again? Because the magnetic field. And that's why I insert this here. But this is going to take time. So I'll do calculation next time, right? So spin up has lower energy because my electric field is pointing down, right? So at the beginning, well, I can just apply the gate bias. You see this VP, I make it negative. Then I push up the quantum dot. As a result, I don't have any electron inside. Can you imagine that? It's just like the, the, the we, I confine the water in the reservoir, right? Now I apply the gate bias to push up the bottom, then all the water will go out. Not reservoir, I mean the quantum dot, right? So they all go out, negative, right? Then I have a certain current, which is a uh, uh, certain current, which indicates I don't have any charge inside. This is just sensing. Now, and then what do I do next is this. In the second step, in particular, I want to emphasize both of these are larger than the Fermi level when we apply the gate bias. Right, so it's empty. Now then, I'm going to increase the gate voltage, this voltage. Increase gate voltage for electron is like you pulling down the well, right? So that you can feel electron, right? Because it becomes more positive. I pull it down. When I pull it down, what will happen? I have both of them smaller than Fermi level of the reservoir then they will speed, start filling up, right? I don't know what they are going to feel. They may feel with a spin down electron or a spin up electron, but they are at different energy level. They only will feel one. This is a little bit confusing here, but it will only feel one because of the so-called Coulomb blockade. Once you feel an electron, your well potential will go up because you are more negative. So it's designed so that once you fill up one, you won't be able to fill up more. It's easy to understand in the sense that you have water bucket. Once you fill up some water, you cannot get more water, right? Or think about once you fill up with something, then the whole thing will go up. Then you cannot fill more. So you can get either up or down, either up or down, right? Now, what if what you get is uh, down, right? We also can take a look at this. You will suddenly see that the current will... Uh, Why, why does current increase? Uh, I, I think this is because of the gate voltage, right? Uh, this is because uh, you have a positive gate voltage to here. Then it actually coupled with this uh, IQPC. So you kind of increase its current substantially. Okay, so that's why you have high current. But then you wait for a while, the electron is going to inject into here, right? Once you inject, then your current will go down right away because now you have a negative charge in the quantum dot that reduce your current, the neighboring IQ, the neighboring transistor, right? So I have a positive voltage going to here, kind of increase my current because of the coupling, the whole system becomes more positive. And then you inject an electron to here, then the whole system becomes a little bit more negative. 
So this current is a signature telling, telling me that, oh, I just injected one electron. Okay? Has nothing to do with readout. Yes, this is just an experimental setup. Now, then how do we know whether it's spin up or spin down? We don't know because it's just an inject one electron. So what we will do is to reduce the gate pulse, what we call the readout pulse, so that you bring this one down so that the spin up electron level is below the uh, Fermi level of the reservoir. But the spin, I mean, the spin up is below the Fermi level of the reservoir, but the spin down is above the Fermi level of the reservoir. Okay? So if your electron is spin up, is spin down, because it is above the Fermi level, what will happen? It will just jump out after a certain time, certain tunneling time, right? Characteristic time. So when you jump out, what will happen? Then you will see an increase in current because you lose a charge in the quantum dot. However, once you jump out, it becomes empty, right? It can actually fill in again with a spin-up electron, right? Because it becomes empty. So once you go up, it will go down again. But if your spin was pointing up, it cannot go out because it's below the Fermi level already. So your current is going to be constant. That is how you do the spin to charge conversion. In a real reading scheme, you don't need to do that, right? Because you might already have the qubit inside the quantum dot after manipulation. So you'll be either spin up or spin down. You just apply the real, the readout pulse. If it is spin up, you will see a bump. If it's spin down, it will be just a constant. Right? You can take a look at this paper, they have the experimental result. It won't be that nice, but you clearly see that the signal to noise ratio is high enough. Right? You will see something like this. If it is spin up, you will see, you really see something like this. And when it is spin down, you will see something like this. Okay, and then based on this, they know that this is uh, spin down, this is spin up, and this is spin down. Okay, so that's it. I already told you what, how to, and then this is just too empty. We don't need to care about step four. That is how you read out a qubit, whether it is uh, spin up or spin down. Okay. Uh, and may, maybe uh, then uh, next week I will just uh, do some calculation and then we will go to talk about how to uh, I still have read out but this is I mean, uh, a more systematic way about the single qubit and two qubit gate okay okay that's it. Ooh.